Photosynthesis is a two-step process. The first step is the light-dependent reactions. The second step is called the light-independent reactions. I often will just simply call it the Calvin cycle. It makes it easier for my students to remember and hear the difference between the two steps. But they call it the light-independent reactions because it does not depend on light. Now, if you turn off the lights, this process will grind to a halt because this is the step that uses the energy from earlier to build glucose. Now, the building of glucose from carbon dioxide in the air, this is something that is often called carbon fixation. To fix any um, element or atom in uh, scientific terms means to put it into a usable form. So carbon fixation is the building of glucose or other sugars using carbon dioxide in the air. Now, this happens in the stroma of the chloroplast, the organelle of photosynthesis. And it's using the energy that's in ATP molecules and the energy of the electrons being carried by NADPH that were being provided uh, to the stroma by the light-dependent reactions. Let's take a closer look. Again, I always like to remind students that photosynthesis is happening in the chloroplasts that are inside a plant cell. And every plant is made out of gazillions of these plant cells. So if we zoom in on one of these chloroplasts, we'll see there's the out, inner and outer membrane, and then there's these stacks of membranes. Each of these little sacs is called a thylakoid, and they're arranged in these stacks called grana. They're floating in the liquidy stroma. Now, the light-dependent reactions occurred on the thylakoid membrane, and they send their materials, the ATP and NADPH, to the stroma. And that's what we see going on here. So the light reactions are providing ATP and NADPH, and those are being consumed by the Calvin cycle as it takes in carbon dioxide from the air, does that carbon fixation I mentioned, and spits out some uh, sugars. Now you'll notice it's a cycle. So it starts off with some building materials, adds the CO2 to them, builds some glucose, but it has to recycle a lot of those materials in order to have your starting materials from the beginning again. It sends the used up adenosine diphosphate and NADP positive back to the thylakoid membrane where it can be recharged with energy so you can continue doing the Calvin cycle. Now let's take a closer look. So there's a lot of names of molecules in here and depending on your teacher you may need to memorize the names or not. A lot of times I don't bother but I'll give you those names just in case. So it begins with a five carbon molecule here called ribulose bisphosphate. The bis just means it has two phosphates on the end of this five carbon ribulose molecule. I've used the blue marbles here to represent the carbons and the yellowy white ones to represent the phosphates. Now, are there other atoms? Yeah, there's a bunch of oxygens and hydrogens, but I'm just going to focus in on the carbons. Just know that sometimes when I'm going from, say, a three carbon molecule to a three carbon molecule there, there are significant differences. I may be removing a hydrogen from one position and putting it on another, breaking off an OH group, putting on a double bound oxygen, but let's just follow the carbons. So here we have our five carbon ribulose bisphosphate and we ram it together with a six, sorry, with this carbon dioxide up there which has one carbon in it. That makes a six carbon molecule. Now scientists love to name things. Why don't they name that six carbon molecule? Because it falls apart immediately. It's unstable. So luckily we don't have to remember, remember its name. It breaks apart into a pair of these phosphoglycerate, um, sorry, phosphoglycerate molecules here. I'm used to calling it phosphoglyceric acid. Now, for every six ribulose bisphosphates that I add six carbon dioxides to, that would give me 12 phosphoglycerates. Now, I need to energize this molecule in order to make some of the chemical changes that I want to make to it. So I add a phosphate onto the opposite end. It already had one phosphate, now it has two. So we call it bisphosphoglycerate. Sometimes other books I've seen it called dye, dye and bis, they both mean two. I don't know why the difference. Maybe it's an East Coast, West Coast kind of thing. So anyway, now we have our bisphosphoglycerate, sorry, we have our bisphosphoglycerate molecule here. Now we can make some major changes. We add some additional electrons from NADPH, and these are special electrons. They're electrons that have lots of energy, just like a baseball that's flying through the air has lots of kinetic energy, or a bowling ball on top of a shelf has energy as opposed to a bowling ball on the bottom of the floor. It has very little energy in it. These high energy electrons allow us to make some major alterations and turn this bisphosphoglycerate into a different molecule 
that's a kind of glyceraldehyde. Now this glyceraldehyde is a three carbon molecule, now that's an aldehyde, and on its third carbon it has a phosphate ion. So we call it glyceraldehyde that has a phosphate on its third ion, or glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now these names are really big, so I'm going, going to give you their abbreviations. Ribulose bisphosphate is called RUBP. Phosphoglycerate is often just called PG. Bisphosphoglycerate would be called BPG, or in those dye textbooks, DPG. And glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is commonly called G3P. All right, so you get the pattern here. Now, from these 12 here, there's 12 of these three carbon molecules. If I count up the carbons, I get 36. So that's 36 carbons. I need to recycle back to my beginning. And I had six of these five carbon molecules. Let's see, six times five is 30. So I need to keep 30 of my carbons in order to keep doing the cycle. But that does mean that I can skim off six of my 36 carbons down here. And how can I do that? Hey, if I take two of these glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates, or G3Ps, and ram them together, I can actually make glucose or any other sugar, or I can use it to build most of the other sugars with some modification. That leaves me with 10 of them left over. Now, every step here has been pretty straightforward. You have 5 plus 1 divided in half, that gives you 3. 3. 3. Everything's been pretty simple. And down here, the pair of G3Ps that I've skimmed off to make glucose, glucose is a 6 carbon molecule. Here I have 3, there I have 5. There's no easy math here. And in fact, most textbooks don't show all the steps here. And nobody really cares except some biochemists. So just let's pretend some magic happens. So the magical ATP fairy comes along, adds some energy, and a bunch of enzymes help this process happen. And we've recycled our way back to our starting material. So this is it. This is the Calvin cycle of light independent reactions. It takes carbon dioxide, adds it to REBP, turns it into a series of different chemicals, and ultimately allows you to pull out a few of those in order to make the glucose, and then you spend a little bit more energy to recycle back to the beginning.